Hello, everyone, and welcome to Own Your Own Network, Continuous Monitoring. I'm Jason Keeler with the SANS Institute, and I will be moderating this webcast. Today's featured speakers are Jerry Shank, Senior Analyst with the SANS Institute, and Michael Philander, Product Marketing Director with Tripwire, Inc. Before I turn things over to Jerry and Michael, the Q&A portion will take place during the webcast. Please feel free to submit your questions at any point by using the chat window. Right now, I'd like to introduce our featured speakers, Jerry Shank and Michael Philander. Thank you, Jason. Um, I'd like to start off by thanking Tripwire for sponsoring this webcast. Continuous monitoring has, has gotten a, a quite a bit of attention lately due to some new federal initiatives and with a number of high-profile attacks that just simply lasted too long. Organizations are becoming more aware of the need to be constantly on guard. Tripwire has been in this field for quite a few years. Uh, they, they might not, it might not have been called continuous monitoring way back then, but they were one of the first players, if not the first, in the IT space. Um, um, missing my button here. There we go. Uh, ancient civilizations knew the value of continuous monitoring. This engraving of Babylon was done in 1736 based on ancient descriptions. The image is from www.alexanderstomb.com and is copyrighted by Andrew Chubb. The city, the city had a moat. It had a wall 330 feet high. That's a big wall. And there was possibly another wall. The city was impenetrable. That is, until the night in 539 BC, when the Persian army diverted the Euphrates River, crept in, and opened the gates. Often, organizations deemed their network security to be robust enough to withstand any attack. Somebody contacts their parts supplier, buys a firewall, installs it, and goes home, assuming the organization is now safe. But of course, nobody here believes that, or you wouldn't be here. But that idea is too common. Since the threat landscape is constantly changing, Federal agencies are now required to continuously monitor their systems and defenses. And most other IT organizations also have some type of requirement to do various degrees of monitoring. Monitoring firewall logs, IDS logs, and event logs isn't exactly easy, but we're getting better at that. But what else should we be monitoring? Different organizations have different requirements for what should be monitored and how to do it. FISMA has requirements for federal agencies. PCI DSS has some requirements. GLBA and SOX weigh in on financial organizations. And there are various organizations that offer help with continuous monitoring. Various certs have some ideas. SANS has the 20 critical security controls. And Tripwire, of course, who has been in this field for a long time, also has some ideas on it. Let's start by defining the term, continuous monitoring. Each organization may want to tweak this a little bit, but there are four basic phases. The discovery phase, the analysis phase, tuning phase, and reporting. You could split up some of these a little, but it's a low level, but this is a low level breakdown. By using only four phases, this is a flexible plan that can be adjusted for a wide range of applications, even outside of IT applications. In fact, one part of the tuning phase is tuning the whole process. Things will change. In fact, most organizations should start with modest detection and remediation goals with the long-term goal of shortening the time frame and including more of their systems as they get their automated tools in place and tuned. We'll look at a few ideas for each of these phases. The SANS 20 Critical Security Controls paper would be another great resource for this process. That paper has lots of detail. It also has metrics for testing the different controls, and it has quick wins ideas for jump-starting your individual security initiatives to get them started quickly. There are a few simple things that you, that you there are a few things that you simply have to have in place, or your continuous monitoring initiatives simply won't work. Well, maybe that's a little too strong, but if you're missing any of these, you will be hampered in your efforts. Automation. You need to check your systems periodically and even have an aggressive system for checking things. But, but we're talking about more than just checking your patch management software, running a scan, and checking your log server. You need to have processes in place to automate all that. Some people talk about real-time alerting. I have, a, I have a bit of a problem with that term because I'm not, I'm not sure it even exists. 
We would like to get close, though. Initially, detection in 24 hours is probably a good start, probably better than, you, better than you're doing now. But we'd like to see that eventually get down to detection in two minutes and resolution, resolution or isolation in five. And, we, and, and you simply can't do that without automation. Consistent configurations are also a must. You need to have a baseline to test against. And management needs to be on board for this. And management will need to participate at some level. Decisions will need to be made about what security risks are acceptable, which systems are most critical for the ultimate purposes of the organization, and of course some manpower will be required to keep it going. And of course reporting. You'll want to report on the initial state of the organization and then periodically report to management on headway that is being made. And you'll want to be able to report on the current state of affairs. Let's look at the first phase. This is discovery. Some organizations don't even know what they have. Most penetration testers have run into situations where they have reported where they have reported services or hardware to the client that they didn't even know they had. Certainly services that they didn't know were available publicly. You want a complete inventory of all hardware that is on your network. That should include test equipment. Often test equipment can be put online temporarily and ends up staying on far longer than people expected. And legacy equipment. If you need to keep that old system around for a while, make sure you keep updating it. You also, want, you also want to document all your software. This can be made easier with automatic, automated tools. In fact, for most organizations, that's the only practical way to do it and be able to keep rediscovering changes the way you should. And services. By services, we're referring to services that are provided by the computers. Web servers, mail servers, any service that any computing device offers to a client. We need to track them all because each open port is a potential opening to an attacker. And when you run your discovery next, you want to verify that no new services are open. In our example of the fall of Babylon, they had huge walls. But they also had an unknown vulnerability. Nobody considered that it would be possible to divert that fast-running Euphrates River to allow an, an army to wade through. Unknown issues are big for a network also. This is one reason that you want to run automated scans of your network. You need to know as soon as possible if there is a new service on your network. Even if it's only internal, that is an indication that something has changed and you need to identify if it's hostile. In addition to keeping track, in addition to keeping track of your assets, you should also keep track of any threat agents. That is, those who would desire to, to steal things of value or inflict harm on your organization, or both. These could be competitors, hostile countries, or just someone looking for an easy target. The military calls this situational awareness. It's important if you are working or living in a hostile zone to maintain situational awareness. And the Internet is pretty much a hostile zone. This week, I'm sure everyone is thinking about Libya. There was a lack of situational awareness there. Probably a lot of details we know nothing about, but we want to avoid that type of situational awareness, of lack of situational awareness in our organizations by keeping abreast of possible attacks against your infrastructure. We need to be aware of any connections to our network. The Internet connection, of course, is one. But how about a backup connection that is used only for emergencies? I once found an administrator's machine wide open on one of them. How about a wireless connection or connections to remote branches or partners? As we are assessing threats, we need to be aware of the motivation of, hackers, of, of attackers. I often hear people say, I don't have anything they would want. Oh yeah? <laughs> you aren't thinking deep enough. Even if you actually do have nothing on your computer, which isn't true, but first case of argument, let's assume that it is. If you have nothing on your computer, a bot herder, that's the person who runs a botnet, a bot herder could at least, he would at least like to have your internet connection and processing power to get it, to help him get his work done. For a large network, that quote, nothing computer, is at the very least a connection to the inside of the network. From any computer on the inside, 
an attacker can work their way into other computers. Of course, financial motivation is big, big right now also, credit cards or information for identity theft. The point is that every organization needs to seriously consider why various groups would want to attack their organization. That will help with blocking the holes. And monitor new attack methods. Last week, there was a serious Internet Explorer vulnerability. For a few days, there was no solution. So from a personal standpoint, I was careful about my browsing habits. From a continuous monitoring standpoint, this would be a time to alert users to the issues and keep an extra lookout for browser attacks and then patch quickly when the patch becomes available. And it is available now. It is also helpful to brainstorm about all these points. Sometimes the craziest ideas actually work. So if you can find and fix them before the attacker does, well, that's the goal. Still under discovery, let's look at some auditing options. One of the top things to audit is your configurations. And the more consistent they are, the easier the auditing will be. In the SANS 20 CSC paper, the Critical Security Controls paper, Control 3 deals with the auditing of laptops, workstations, and servers, and Control 10 deals with network devices and firewalls. If your organization doesn't have controls for deploying equipment in a consistent manner, mistakes will be made and it will be more difficult to monitor devices. It will also be more difficult to know when changes need to be applied because of new security issues that have come to light. As a general rule, an organization should avoid default usernames and passwords. Attackers don't have to try very hard to find the defaults once they know what type of equipment you have. They can do research on the Internet to find them. They can download documentation, and they can even purchase a system to match your equipment and do their own analysis. Default authentication credentials are often referred to as low-hanging fruit. Even an inexperienced adversary can attack your system if it is using documented defaults. Our next major phase is analysis, and we'll start off by analyzing your vulnerabilities. This phase will often be done in conjunction with discovery. In fact, the software, in fact, the software that, that documents your network may immediately flag some issues as vulnerabilities. On the inside of your network, these scans should be able to use administrative credentials so that they can query the system for information as well as identifying re vulnerabilities remotely. You might want to hire a penetration tester to test the external points of your network or the internal points, but you can certainly start yourself. Scan for IP addresses that are in your range. Scan for ports that are open. Many parts of this are not particularly complicated. It's mostly just documenting what you find and comparing that to what you think you should have. Last week, one day was Talk Like a Pirate Day. Well, for IT administrators, every day should be Think Like an Attacker Day. Keep your eyes open for new tricks. Earlier this month, I heard about a, a, well, what's that thing in the corner look like? I'd love to hear some feedback, but obviously in a webcast, that's not going to work. It looks like a pretty normal power strip. Kind of beefy. Maybe it has some extra surge suppression or UPS capabilities. No, it has a whole Linux computer in it. And those are Ethernet ports on the side there, up by the power cord, where the power cord comes out. This thing is designed to connect through your network to a waiting server on the outside to hand an attacker a back door into your network. And it comes pre-configured with lots of tools that an attacker could use to analyze your network. This is supposed to be shipping in a few days. One way to find a power pwn, that's what this thing's called, power PWN, is to monitor your network traffic. If a rogue computer is going to use your network to connect to the Internet, that traffic will pass through network choke points. Those are typically connections between buildings and connections to the Internet. Much, um, much of the hostile traffic connects to known botnets and known hostile IP ad address ranges that can be detected by an IDS. In the case of a specific targeted attack, it can be more difficult. Another thing to think about while you're brainstorming, what if that power Jerry, phone? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I have a I have a question here. Okay. Do you, Do you think the internal and external scan should be done with administrator rights? 
Um, well, there's two, two different types of scans. There's, there's just scanning for ports that can be done that can be done just on a computer. But then those those connections where you when you're on the inside, you can run you can run scans that actually connect to a computer and pull down lists of hardware that's running, lists of software that's so so. When you're on the inside, you can use the administrative rights to gain you additional to, to get you additional information at a fuller inventory. Does that answer the question? That Jerry, this is Michael. I think that's a good answer to it, and, and we get that question actually a lot in terms of authenticated scans and what is the level of. Um, Authority, basically, for those authenticating scans, and I think the short answer from a tripwire perspective is it really kind of depends. Um, I think uh, authenticated scans, you get, as uh, Jerry is saying, a lot more information, more configuration items if you're doing configuration assessment scans, and much more insight into those systems. You just have to be careful that you don't overuse that power. Okay, great. And keep those questions coming. If you have any other questions, just feel free to just jump right in. One of the moderators here will interrupt me and, and let us know because because if, if we can hit the question while we're while we're discussing it, I think things flow a little better. Um, we were talking about this power pwn, and you know what 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 if while you while you're brainstorming, you talked a little bit earlier about brainstorming. What if you're what if you're brainstorming about things and somebody sees it? What if this power pwn had some other way to connect to an attacker, like maybe Wi-Fi? Or GSM. Well, it does. Uh, that 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 makes more life that makes life more difficult. But but it would still have to send traffic out through the network, and it would be connecting to your servers, to your workstations, uh, to switches and firewalls throughout your network. So the one big thing for traffic analysis, another big thing for traffic analysis is to also monitor for lack of traffic. If your IDS doesn't see anything for a period of time, say an hour, or certainly for a day, that's not good either. I've seen cases where managed IDSs were misconfigured so that they never saw any traffic, and nobody knew. Everybody assumed that no alerts was a good thing. Logs can also be logs can be a lot of work, but even in most careful, precise attacks involve crashing services, logging users in at abnormal times. Connecting unknown devices to the network, and/or transferring files, and that info, that information should be included in that pile of logs if logging is enabled and configured correctly. All of this could be detected, but often it's not. As I said before, according to the 2012 Verizon Data Breach Investigations Report, over half of all breaches were discovered by a third party. The SANS 20 CSC paper give some additional advice on logging in Critical Control 14. Start off by collecting logs. Most servers, routers, switches, and security devices support logging, but it needs to be turned on and pointed toward your log server. Then start to detect, start detecting something. Do, do what you can. Watch, watch for failed logins, for blocked firewall traffic. Um, you should have egress rules set up to allow only outbound traffic that has a business purpose. Any attempt to ship data out of your network will probably hit probably hit more than one of these rules. Baseline analysis is also a good starting point. This is the process of determining what is normal for your network and then alerting based on deviations from that baseline. So for example, most networks have some failed logins. Well, one, if you if you suddenly hit ten times that that baseline, then then you want to look into that. And there are a few other suggestions in that in that SANS paper. The next main process is tuning. Once you've discovered and documented your network, and then you've started to do some analysis, you will almost certainly find some gaps between what you want and what you between what you want to have on your network and what you find is actually there. So now it's time to do some tuning. That consists of modifying your existing configuration to meet what you have previously decided you want. Services on a network are functions that are available remotely, either outside the network or to internal users. Typically, typically the changes will show up as unexpected ports that are open or services that are intentionally available but that are running vulnerable versions or vulnerable configurations. The immediate need 
is to disable services that should not be available and update the versions and configurations of those that are. Another long-term solution is to ensure that new devices are deployed in a consistent, secure manner. One option for this is specific configuration notes. In the case of computers that will, be, that will be deployed many times over, a secure image should be configured that can be applied as part of the deployment process. It is also possible to order servers and workstations with a build on them that is specific to your organization. But make sure you test it after, after, after they arrive to make sure that you got what you ordered. It seems like every organization also has some computer that is running some service that some segment of your organization just must have, even though it's not secure. Somebody in the decision-making position will need to make the call. It's easy for an outsider, like me, to say, just pull it off till it's fixed. But that's simply not a reality. If you must run that vulnerable service, add it to a list of exempted systems and identify the owner of this system for periodic follow-up. This should be a very short list. Also, set up special monitoring that will target the vulnerable issue and alert as appropriate. The, the next issue that we've included here is patch management. This will never stop. Centralized automated patch management is a practical necessity for most organizations. This can help an organization maintain consistent workstations, but it can also report on workstations that are out of sync. We've had configuration and patch management already, so let's move on to traffic issues. There we go. When traffic is detected that is outside the norm, that is, it seems odd or blatantly hostile, what do you do? Maybe you get a detect from an IDS that definitely states that this is hostile traffic. First, don't panic. Move carefully and methodically. If it really is really bad, they already got something, so you don't want to lose evidence that you have. We're not going to get an incident response. We're not going to get into incident response today, except to suggest that you have a plan in place and have a team ready to call for cases like this. In all reality, it often is not as bad as it looks. Some events trigger on attacks. That's good, but it doesn't necessarily mean that your network got hacked because the attack may, not, may have failed. There are also false positives. Just so, so make sure you understand what you're looking at before you react. This is especially true with a new implementation. You, 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 just, you just don't know what you, you're just not sure what you've got yet. Sometimes you will see excessive outbound traffic or perhaps traffic from a host that you can't identify. Once you have determined what is happening, then you can decide what tuning steps need to be taken. If you determine that for some reason you may not know yet, your customer database is being shipped off to China. You might want to pull the network connection. But again, this should be based on decisions that you have made in advance, an incident handling plan. If you detect a workstation communicating with a botnet, basically the same thing, but perhaps quite, not quite as bad. Once again, the policy prevails, but you probably will want to disconnect the internet connection, do some analysis of what's going on, and then resolve the problem. Logging issues and network issues are often related. Um, I think a slide there. There we go. Logging issues and network are often related. Actually, they should be considered together. One general starting point for looking at logs is to generate some baselines. We just talked about network traffic, and to some, and to some related baselines for that would be blocked traffic. If you suddenly see a spike in blocked traffic coming into your network, you might be under reconnaissance, or someone else might have their network configured wrong, someone on the outside. Just because you see traffic, don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Another item that, are, that is good for baselining would be login failures. Successes should also be, log, be, discuss, be, be logged. Much of what we discussed under networks could also be found under logs. Firewall logs can often report file transfers and connections between hosts. Firewall logs and traffic analysis often show different sides of the same connection. Server logs can also be tied in. For example, if you have an attack on a web server, you should be able to see connections coming through the firewall. Traffic that matches signatures in an IDS and page requests on the web server log. In this case, the tuning that should be done might be to block the attacker or monitor the attacker and contact law enforcement. 
The tuning might also include looking at the attack, looking at the attack pattern, and the server configuration, and the server's defenses to verify that the server is not vulnerable to the attack. Operational events are more or less your routine events. Users log in, they log out, they access files, servers start up and shut down. Perhaps you collect information from switches that would indicate when ports go up and down. All these seemingly mundane events can be interesting in, connect in conjunction with other events. Tuning in these cases would tie in with the analysis piece and might include fixing a problem with a server that repeatedly reboots or doing a deeper analysis on a server that was rebooted after being crashed by an attacker. And of course, the entire monitoring process needs to be tuned periodically. One thing you should constantly be doing is trying to decrease your response time. When you initially start your continuous monitoring, detecting an issue in 24 hours and responding a few hours later is probably lots better than what you had. But over time, you want to detect issues within two minutes and respond in another couple of minutes. Don't be discouraged by by, by, by vendors offering real-time alerting, or at least find out how they define that. Um, I guess most of the time that term means that they are constantly doing detection and not waiting for daily report, or something along those lines. You will also need to keep up with network changes. Your network will change, and you need to keep adding new features and removing some from time to time. And the monitoring technology, and the modern technology is changing also. So new ways to monitor will, will, will keep coming out. Keep skipping slides here. Reports, reports are important. Kind of tough for a lot of us in the trenches, guys, but it's, an, it's important to be able to tell others what progress you've made and to be able to show what needs to be done. An early status report can be helpful to reference in, in, in a few months to doc, and to document the process has been made. There will be systems that you will have to run that are in violation of your configured baselines. We talked about them before. It seems like every organization has one or more program that is critical to somebody, but from a security standpoint, it's a nightmare. You will want to be able to run a report on these machines that need special consideration. You want to keep a special eye on them and make sure they get updated or pulled into compliance as soon as possible, and that they get removed when they are no longer needed. You also want to be able to verify with responsible parties that they are keeping up with changes, patches, and monitoring logs. In this case, gap analysis refers to devices that are out of compliance and need to be fixed, or, or perhaps network traffic that has been detected as being abnormal and needs to be fixed by a special, needs to be analyzed by a special team. I'm tough time with my clicker here today. Uh, it's, it's a big job. It really is. But don't try to tackle too much all at once. Remember that you're moving the right direction. The three key starting points. Determine, determine your key operation, operational and electrical property assets. Start working on the stuff that matters the most. Quick wins. We've talked about quick wins a few times. Don't shoot for 100%. I mean, maybe eventually. But don't, don't get hung up on 100%. The SANS 20 CSC paper has at least one, usually more than one, quick win for each control. These are generally things that you can do with minimal expense in both time and money invested. They're, they are actual practical ideas for getting started. And prioritize alerts. You don't want to have your phone going off for everything. Pick the most important things to alert on. Each environment is different, but if you send out an alert that wakes somebody up once a week, pretty soon that will get turned off. Email alerts work fine for most things, and later, once the initial install has settled down a bit, then perhaps you can turn on the annoying stuff, but only once you are sure that it won't false alarm. And that's all I've got. Now I'd like to pass the mic over to Michael Thielander from Tripwire um, and keep these questions coming in. Let me just let's see, were there any that? Yeah, keep we've questions caught up coming with, in. Yeah, looks like we've caught up with everything there, Jerry. But please keep questions coming in. Um, thanks very much, Jerry, for that overview and those steps. I think that's a great process. And that's going to tie really nicely to just a few words that I want to say about Tripwire's 
perspective on continuous monitoring and how we view continuous monitoring and what we do with it, how we contribute to solving the problem. Um, I won't do a big tripwire commercial here, just briefly to say that we've, as Jerry said, we've been in this market for a long time. We just celebrated our 14th birthday, actually, uh, literally yesterday. As we go into our 15th year, um, we continue to expand the security solutions and capabilities that we offer to our customers, but they're all founded in this notion of continuous monitoring. And I might, you know, take some time to actually phrase that. And as Jerry pointed out earlier, what does continuous mean? What is the definition of continuous? And I'm going to provide you with a, a sort of definition here and hopefully a practical example of what it means to truly do continuous monitoring. Because I think all of us would challenge that notion to say, no, I can't, co I can't actually check every single log every single minute all the time. So how do I find a practical approach to continuous? I want to frame that really briefly in the products that we offer the market, Tripwire Enterprise, Tripwire Log Center, and our Via Data Marm. And their jobs, if you will, as it relates to continuous monitoring, um, really with Tripwire Enterprise, really focusing on security configuration management, securing your configurations, which Jerry referred to as uh, critical controls 3 and 10, and also supporting a number of other critical controls in the SANS 20 critical controls. Hey, Michael. Seven. Yes. I have a question here. The companies I have worked at were really terrible about keeping the number of alerts under control. Apparently, this is really hard. What things do you suggest? I have a suggestion. Actually, Jerry did touch on that a little bit in his tuning, but I, I have a suggestion, too, particularly as it relates to defining the subset of the things that you deem critical. There's first the question of assets and then the tests that you do on that. So I think Jerry implied this. He says, don't try to put your arms around everything at once. If we look at what we do in Tripwire Enterprise, security configuration management, let's just say that you're going to adopt the uh, CIS benchmarks for your Windows server, which is about 140 tests. Um, my first point would be don't do all 140 tests. You know, there, there are levels of criticality within those. Do 20 of those tests, and then you're only going to get alerts on changes to configuration items in those 20. You're not going to get them all at once. And then as you start working through those and you start tuning those, um, you can add more of those tests. So I think the, the biggest issue is how much do you bite off at any one time? The reason it's hard, the reason it is really difficult, as the caller points out, is that I think customers try to put their arms around everything all at once. Um, Jerry, do you have anything to add to that? No, that's, that's, that's basically it. But I, I've seen that happen lots of times. You, it's, it's really easy to say, oh, this is important. This, you got you to decide what is really important, what is, waking, what is worth waking you up at night. <laughs> and then I mean, some, things, some things can wait. And really, if you do have, if you have that much stuff that has to be happening, well, maybe you need somebody online 24-7. Right, and I think that's a really good point. And knowing knowing what you have, what's important in terms of the assets and the information that's on those assets as well. I want to give one example here that's sort of a graphic example of a way to look at this whole notion of continuous. And it really supports what Jerry was saying earlier about what what is continuous about continuous monitoring is not the monitoring but rather it's the baseline and your effort to establish and maintain that baseline. And when customers need to go out, when our customers need to go out, and originally they look at, I'm going to all use the context of configuration items, you know, securing configurations, hardening systems here, for again, whether it's a Windows server or a Linux server or a network device. If you try to do this manually, this is what you get. You have a really hard time capturing those configuration items. When you don't have any remediation advice, you don't really know how to correct those. It's not very automated. Jerry also mentioned automation is the key. And then as soon as you've achieved some level of what you'd say consistency, you slip from that state. Configuration drift is rampant. Anytime that we try to deploy new applications, patches, features, we're inviting configuration drift, which is really the, em the enemy of keeping this consistent baseline. So that's what it looks like manually. So along came uh, a couple years ago, we're going to do this notion of um, and then obviously, one of the keys to that, it's really audit driven, which is a bit of a shame. It's very reactive. It's not proactive at all. And of course, we have the whole slope, the front side of this curve is all um, ongoing risk and then risk after that. Entered this notion a couple of years ago, we're going to do these periodic mega scans and um, patch management solutions, especially external credential patch management solutions, do this really well. Uh, and I can't, uh, for a second, complain about the way they grab those configuration items, the states. You know, is Telnet available? Are these services available on the system? In other words, how hardened is it? They do a really good job at it. The problem uh, is, uh, because there's no notion of continuous and there's really no notion of the baseline, you have the same drift problem. As soon as you've achieved that hardened state, let's say that these cycles are every 30 days, which is, I, I find fairly typical for external network scanning. Um, 
you just have gaps. You just invite risk and uncertainty, whether it's days or weeks or months between these scans, and you really just don't know what's going on. For any given period in time, as soon as you, you know, fall off of that peak, you start inviting more and more uncertainty. So what are the issues and the takeaways with that? There's, there's less risk with these periodic mega scans. Um, Patch and vulnerability solutions, external credentials ones, aren't the only systems that do these mega scans, by the way. Um, but it's a really good example, of, especially as it pertains to grabbing configuration items and testing those against some benchmark or standard. But really, it's just more work in the long run. You've really taken the things that you do in this very manual, periodic process and turned it into sort of an automated process, but not truly automated. You still have more work in the long run. You've not exerted uh, total control over the system, and that's what this, uh, this session is really all about. It's about owning your network, which equates to total control. Um, and I'm having the same slide uh, problems that Jerry was having here. So another view of it is what does continuous monitoring really look like? And the focus of this is really establish the baseline. And the bigger focus is I want everybody to think about um, continual as a response to a change. In other words, it's not that I'm continuously monitoring those configuration items or systems or even logs. It's that I have a baseline that I trust. I do trust my baseline, and now I'm only monitoring deviations from that baseline. So you exert your effort up front in terms of establishing the baseline, and then you employ an automated tool. It's interesting that when you do look at this hands 20 critical controls, and, uh, particularly around 3 and 10, they mentioned that the enabling technology behind you know, capturing this continuous information about your configuration states is actually file integrity monitoring. And what the reason it's enabling is that it's able to establish a baseline, tell you when there's a deviation from it, and then only respond and alert when there's a deviation to a configure you know, a configuration has gone bad. Let's say if we use the telnet example, the policy says thou shalt not enable telnet on this server. And uh, again, to reiterate what Jerry said before, before, always start with a policy. Uh, always start with an institutional understanding of what's good and what's bad or what's accepted or expected. Um, and then when there's a deviation from that, only alert on those deviations, alert on deviations from that baseline. And to go back to the, the question that was asked in chat just a little bit ago, if you tightly scope those down, if you scope down the things that you're looking at, only alert on the deviations, and then broadly or generally broaden, slowly broaden, the number of configurations that your uh, items that you're looking at in this case, or logs that you're looking at in the case of log management, you can actually get to this notion of continuous. You're not, you've reframed continuous to not be eyeballs on the logs every minute, every day, but eyeballs on the logs when there's a response to something that ought to not be there, when I've established a baseline of what is the, the known and trusted or the accepted state. And when you do it this way, obviously the limit to the uncertainty and risk windows is tremendous. You're responding, again, in this example of configuration assessment, only when the configuration item, when the states change and as they happen, you're only reporting on deviations from known good as opposed to getting a whole bunch of information and then having to sort it. And you sort of use a, a manufacturing sense of build once, use one, many. The baseline is what you build, and you use that continually to look at deviation from that system. Uh, and it's really the integrated approach. If you read SANS 3 and 10, it's the integrated approach with um, the, uh, several elements of policy assessment baseline and then deviation known from file integrity um, that enables that whole process. Um, and so like Jerry did, and I think he did a very good job uh, pointing out the things that are most important to do, we have four very simple steps that we like to recommend. First, uh, categorize your assets. To go back to the question that was, uh, you know, how do you avoid all the noise? Start with a categorization of assets. Have high, medium, and low. Have the location or the mission that it's involved in, or service dependency mapping is really helpful here. So if I know that to enable this uh, back-end web server, these other services are required, and it's critical to the business, that helps you categorize those assets really rapidly. Um, and then only after you've done that do you set up configuration monitoring. So uh, consensus audit guideline 3 and 10, controls 3 and 10. Uh, if, you're, if you're in the government, in the defense space, the DISA stigs are super helpful for that. CAS benchmarks have a number of requirements, um, a number of benchmarks that are very helpful in establishing it as well. And then determine what's acceptable. Again, the question is, I get too much noise, I get too many deviations. Well, there's an amount of risk that you're willing to accept in uh, you know, assessing configuration items. In some sense, it's binary. It's, it's acceptable or it's not, but there's often a threshold in there. Um, how bad is it? And when you have a solution in place, and I won't do too many plugs for Tripwire Enterprise, but it's really good at allowing this. You know, determine the threshold. 
um, I do want notification uh, when there's a deviation, but I want a more urgent, a louder notification if there's a significant deviation. If I have a whole number of services that should not be running on this machine, or ports that are open, or accessibility options on this that should not be there. Um, uh, we mentioned the Verizon data breach investigation report, and it said again in 2012, just like it said in 2011, many, many breaches are because uh, RDP settings on you know, remote desktop protocol settings, uh, particularly in the desktop environment, are left enabled. Um, and that leads to other access to other systems, all of the servers and systems that those systems have access to. And then I think the last step from Tripwire's perspective, at least in beginning this process, goes back to what Jerry said, define your reporting and response procedures. That can be, um, well, unfortunately, it can be reactive. As many of you know, it can be very, very reactive. And you can be chasing that report all the time and that critical alert. But I think I want to reiterate what Jerry said earlier. Define your policy, your procedure up front. What am I going to report on? What do I determine critical? And who cares? Who do I rule this up to? Uh, what we're finding more and more is uh, configuration assessment, You know, uh, understanding what the, your overall hardening posture is at any one time uh, is really valuable in the upper levels of the organization. Executives actually can use that as an objective measure of our overall security. But they don't need to see all the pieces that roll into it. They don't need to see all of the test failures. They really want sort of a sum score, and they want some trend information around that as well. So, so that's my contribution to this webcast. A little bit of graphic explanation of how we're trying to talk about and think about continuous monitoring and four steps that are available to continuous monitoring. When you, uh, if you were to download a PDF of this webcast, we do have, uh, other than the, the really excellent paper that Jerry just wrote on this topic, um, things that we've other also done recently, achieving FISMA compliance with its focus on continuous monitoring is a white paper that's available through Tripwire. Uh, uh, white paper that really focuses on automation. Um, again, Jerry really hit this really well. It's automation that makes continuous monitoring available, automating the baseline management and also deviations from that baseline. And then responding to new threats. Uh, here's a question. Uh, should our reports include compliance posture to show our higher ups? What else would they like to see? So I would say absolutely. Um, uh, as the executives in an organization become more aware of and more concerned with uh, overall security posture, um, everything that you do continuously, uh, the benchmark that you're trying to achieve and deviations from that should be rolled up higher in the organization. Look for solutions that enable that. Um, we have an uh, example that I like to use is that just recently a, a chief information security officer, officer CISO in one of our companies was finally invited to executive board meetings and trying to show security posture. And unfortunately, what she chose to cho show the first time was the vulnerability assessment reports with all of the failures. They don't really want to see that. Uh, it, was a, it was an epic fail on her part, as she freely admitted. What they really want to see is what is the sum of that information? Am I better or am I worse? Um, and unfortunately, in the security world, we, we tend to ignore those sort of labels. We want to see things in a very uh, binary way. And we want to see what the actual failure is and be able to judge the impact of that failure, test failure for vulnerability or configuration items or even logging settings uh, in a tremendous granularity. Uh, but when you start talking to uh, executives, you need to round that up. You need to you need to bubble it up and put it in some solution, some package, some tool that enables to put it in a context that business can understand. Um, Jerry, do you have anything you want to add to that question, or there's another question that just came in? No, I think you pretty much nailed it. I yeah, I, I really no, I I can't disagree with anything. I really don't have much to add. Let me throw this question right at you, Jerry. The uh, question came, can I use our status output to improve network risk over over time? Can I use our status output? I'm not sure what that means. To improve. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a challenging question. question. We might need to clarify because network I, risk, even by itself, is big. I suppose I suppose that would be that would that would be like 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 the reports that are um, Showing the status of their current network, I, I guess I guess that's I guess that's what that would be, and 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 I would say yes, you you that's that's part of the reason for the reports, so that you can so that you can continue to improve. I hope I'm asking hope I'm answering the right question. Yeah, I think that that seems like the 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 gist of the question. It comes down to with risk, how do I show the organization that we're 
we understand our risks and that we're, we have established a goal to continually reduce risk incrementally. And that's one of the great things that continuous monitoring does is because you've established that baseline, you can say, well, last quarter we had these unmitigated risks, even if it's something simple like uh, critical systems that were not patched within 14 days of a, if that's our policy, within 14 days of availability of a service packer patch. And now we only have, uh, you know, three systems that have that same failing on it. So to show how you're reducing risk over time. All right, any more questions or? Oh, here comes one. Let's see. We have one more question. At what point do you reassess you, you known good? On the other hand, can Tripwire absorb certain deviations into the known good state if they are deemed to be legit? I like this this question. This is uh, this is a bit of a softball to the Tripwire people. So whoever said that, I, I appreciate that because what they're really saying is when do you determine when do you change your known good state? And it's when you've changed services and you've mapped it and you decide that what was business as usual, what was shown as a change or deviation, is now become business as usual. Um, and with Tripwire technologies, particularly Tripwire Enterprise, I have the, the ability to all of this automation discussion is about baseline management. How do I take something that looks like an exception today, but should really become a part of the known good baseline, and track that change, now make it a part of that baseline. And it happens to be a feature set within Tripwire that allows us to do it. We basically promote a deviation. We, we make that a part of the known good baseline. So whether you're using Tripwire or any solution, I would ask you to um, look for that capability. Can I take a deviation and make it part of the accepted or expected baseline? Appro appropriately notate it and say, yeah, but the deviation from our first policy, but here's why. And maybe it's, as Jerry was saying, access to legacy systems, uh, sort of classic one, and a lot of organizations have um, uh, legacy systems they're depending on in a solution uh, set up that, say, have a six-character password, because that's what the legacy technology enabled. CIS says, no, you should have eight, or really you should have 11 for a higher level of security, 11 character password with um, special characters and numbers in it, but you just can't support it, will make that deviation a part of your baseline so that it cuts down on the noise. Um, here's actually another quick question came in. Will Tripwire integrate with ServiceNow? Yes, we will. So we'll actually look at service. We do an integration through our professional services that will do a ServiceNow integration to show uh, where changes that are tracked or delivered through ServiceNow actually can become a part of the, the, the baseline. We've actually got some um, data sheets and some integration briefs on our website. If you go to tripwire.com on and do a quick search on ServiceNow, you'll find something really quickly. All right. We still have time for more questions. If anybody does have questions, please feel free to type them to the moderators through the chat window. Jerry, do you want to answer this Here's one? One came one. about uh, uh, actually discovering assets. Do you want to grab that? Sure. Um, you know, here, let me just read the question. One of our most difficult issues is actually discovering our assets. Any advice on how to do this more comprehensively? Um, well, I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure Michael can talk about how Tripwire does it. Um, there are there are really pretty much low budget ways to do this too. You can scan your network um, um, you, you, using something simple like Nmap or other port scanners. Now, one of the problems with that is, like with the new version of Windows, the firewall comes turned on so that it won't respond to pings. That makes life more difficult. Um, I mean, it, it, it might be an advantage too. I'm not saying you should turn your firewall off, but um, but, but the, the the MAC address tables on your switches should include that information. Um, um, and and, and, and it, it, it can be a little bit difficult. I mean, that's why that's why there are, that's why there are automated tools to do stuff like this. Um, Michael, I'm sure. How, how would how would how would Tripwire handle that? You know, honestly, Jerry, we're a big fan of Nmap, and we have a customized solution that we use when we go in and do an initial engagement or deployment that leverages a lot of Nmap technology. So, okay. uh, and then once you have a solution in place, you have a lot more detective capabilities for looking at new assets. But if you're starting from scratch, start with Nmap. Actually, that's that's uh, the okay. best place to go. Yeah, and 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 that is that is important. I mean, you, you need to go in and discover all your assets because. You know, then what if somebody plugs one of these, one of these souped up power 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 switches into your network? Um, I was on a I was on a I was on a 
job here recently where they fired the network administrator. You know, now, now in a situation like that, okay, we can physically find a lot of computers. What if he's got something stuck in the ceiling? Now, this guy didn't, but, um, and, and generally they don't, but that, that's, that's the same issue. You, you, you need to be able to look at your network and see what you can find. Yeah. Here's a Tripwire question that came in. Can Tripwire monitor the admin account actions on a server or any network devices? The answer is, the short answer is yes. I mean, it's what we do. It's what we do really well. And yes, very often we're actually monitoring admin accounts. It's the who's watching the watcher sort of uh, philosophy. That a lot, that's a lot of the reason the Tripwire gets invited into an environment in the first place is so that we can monitor the privileged user accounts, which is, I think, SANS Control 12. It's really, is that right? I, I don't have my, my cheat list with me, but, you know, monitoring privileged user accounts and activity for privileged users, it's one of the things that uh, Tripwire Enterprises always deploy for. And, it, and yes, actually, we can do it on desktop items as well as on network devices. We had a couple more questions come in. Can Tripwire take any reactive actions in addition to notification? Uh, I, I can interpret what I think that means, and I, I hope this is right. Uh, reactive actions, so, um, and tell me, whoever, uh, Jonathan, whoever asked this question, if I, if I don't answer it correctly, if you ask the question again or just, or just raise your hand. Um, what I interpret by reactive actions, again, goes back to configuration assessment, where we see a configuration item. I'll use the Telnet example again. I've got Telnet enabled on a server where it ought not to be. Um, can we go fix that instead of just notifying yes? Uh, Tripwire actually comes with a remediation manager component of Tripwire. Um, when you get into remediation, particularly of configuration items, um, it's not super hard. I mean, we have automated scripts, and we have sign-off, role-based sign-off and approval for it. Um, it's not. Uh, rocket science, I should say. What's challenging is for you, the user, because you're now negotiating with operations, and they very often don't want somebody that's monitoring security posture to taking operation, uh, operational actions in their environment. You might have an agreement that says, um, I'll tell you what, Tripwire will always re-enable logging on these devices when it's turned off because there's never a situation in which logging should be disabled. That's one of the great ways to uh, actually exploit a system is they go to disable logging because um, um, whether they're doing work or they're doing a patch or upgrade, they don't want to get a whole bunch of log entries, but then they forget to turn it back on, basically. Um, and unfortunately, that, that gives you this automatic anti-forensics capability for attacker in that system. Well, Tripwire can automatically switch logging back on. But again, you just have to, that becomes a negotiation with the operations team. Um, uh, here's a question that I'll take to you because it says Tripwire, right? And it, it says, what is the technical level required to install and configure Tripwire? Um, it's actually remarkably low. We've done uh, we've done uh, tremendous work in the last two releases of Tripwire to um, do self-start, basically. So we have this thing that's called Fast Track now. When you deploy it, we automatically generate the baseline, automatically actually help with deployment, initial setup of the agents, automatically establish the baseline, automatically establish some basic policies if you want to apply, for instance, CIS or PCI policies in your environment. Um, and start generating reports right away, too. So that's one of the biggest issues. As a question was asked earlier, is how do you get your hands around this? Get a system, and Tripwire is a good example of this, that has a lot of automation, set up automation and wizardry built into the front end of it. Um, there's a couple of questions. Well, you uh, get, you get uh, Tripwire Enterprise includes Log Center and Data Mart as well, or are those separate products? Thank you. So they're actually separate products. Um, Tripwire Enterprise is responsible for the, the breadth of security configuration management, which includes file integrity monitoring as well as policy management and remediation. Log Center is just concerned with log collection and analysis and sort of a, the SIM blend of that solution. And Data Mart is actually a totally separate product that if, if you have the problem of how am I going to collect information on my security posture and then roll that up to somebody in the organization that doesn't speak IT security and just wants to understand, have the flexibility of the data to re represent, you know, what's our security posture, that's what DataMart actually does. That's its job in that environment. Um, another one, a question. Can you, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to read it off, but. Oh. Um, uh, so can you... 
Can you explain how Tripwire monitors integrity of log files? Can you distinguish edits to a log file from an attacker as opposed to the program that is logging to the file? That's, this is a, a big and a long question. So I'm going to use the shortest possible answer, which is yes. Um, the way that we actually monitor log files is not passive. It's active, uh, meaning that we, um, in some ways that we term it, we actually open it. We, we mount the file. And we don't just look at, um, for instance, write events or read events. We don't necessarily track or base uh, anything on events, but look at actual changes within the state of the things that are in the file. And if there's a log file, um, or if there's any information, we actually open it up and we can see was it a change to content, was it a change to security settings, was it a change to any of the file attributes, did it change from read only to you know read write capability in a particular file, which is a good indicator. So by having access to all that information and the ability to show before and after, that's what the baseline does for you. That ongoing baseline can show you the difference, what you, what it was before to what it is afterwards, and that's what gives you actually the information of whether or not this is an accidental change, a, a, a this operational configuration drift, for instance, or if this looks like an exploit where uh, we've got lots of examples where uh, changes were made to actual values in a file. And it's easy to see when you see that uh, a number value in a financial file was, for instance, changed from somebody's actually changed their True story. Change their bonus. That IT person sort of hacked the financial, the back end payroll, and changed their bonus from say a thousand to ten thousand, and it actually went a long time without being changed. But forensically, then you, you just look at log records, and they might say, "Oh, there was a write event." But Tripwire Enterprise can open it up and go, "Ooh, this is where that value was actually changed from one thousand to ten thousand." So it's a very powerful tool for discovering intent behind. Um, changes. Was it uh, devious and malicious, or was it just an accidental? Was it just configuration drift? I hope that answers the question. But Thank you so much, Jerry and Michael, for your great presentation, and special thanks to Tripwire Incorporated for bringing this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we really appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, webcast, visit sans.org forward slash webcast. Until next time, take care and we hope to have you back again at the next SANS webcast.